Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, this is the second video. Uh, hopefully, you watched the other one first. Um, again, uh, if you for some reason skip to this video, um, uh, I'm gonna struggle the whole time, so get used to it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> on course then, by the time I post this video, I'll also have posted, um, I guess, a bit of a worksheet or a bit of a study guide you can think of it as. Um, it's not lengthy at all. Um, I am gonna, basically what I would like you to do is, um, <clears throat> you can copy and paste it if you want, but honestly, I just want your answers to the questions that I've asked. Um, I give you page numbers on the worksheet. That's the parentheticals there. Those are, of course, pages for the bigger copy, which I think most of you have. If you have a smaller copy, you're gonna have to look around a little bit to find that stuff. Um, I'll try to remember to give you phrases you can look for to find those pages, and the same goes for um, e-copies. I, no I noticed a couple of you using like uh, electronic copies of the book, um, so I want to try to give you Control F stuff you can you can look for. <clears throat> anyway, in terms of the worksheet, if you haven't done that already, go ahead and open it up. I want you to look at that first, actually, because in my experience, this will go a lot better. Uh, shitty as it is if you do your best to think about the the selections i want you to think about and maybe answer those those few questions that i've given you first before i talk to you so if you haven't done that yet um like in your own document go ahead pause the video um look at that worksheet go through all those questions it won't, it won't take long i promise um I will say, if you haven't paused already, I should have done this first. Um, I give you very brief directions up top. Um, I don't care if your arguments line up with mine. And I say that because I don't want anyone, like, cheating, thinking they need to watch the video first and, like, agree with me, okay? Um, <coughs> however, I do want you to actually try to figure out some arguments or think about some ideas you see present in the book, okay? Um, so take a minute, go do that, come back to the video. <clears throat> this is me giving you a second to do that. All right. <clears throat> Ooh, this is going to suck. All right, to begin with, the first section of the worksheet um, entitled Masculinity. Page 119, the question I give you is, describe the Englishman, right? These are the POWs that uh, the American soldiers meet uh, when they first get to camp and I ask what stands out to you about them <clears throat> in the big book that is on page 119 normally I would read some of this to you but real talk I'm not doing that today so um, you may have to pause occasionally to to read the bits I'm talking about all right anyway what stands out to you really on pages 118 and 119 right we get all kinds of information about these guys. What are they like? <clears throat> what kind of guys are they like, you know? Um, and again, uh, for, the, for the electronic crowd, uh, the Englishman had also been lifting. You can look for that phrase. That'll get you to uh, one of the paragraphs we're looking at anyway. But what have they been doing? They're lifting weights. Uh, their stomachs are like washboards. They're all muscly, right? So they fit a certain stereotype that I think we all understand. We've talked about the sort of physical standards of masculinity, right? Okay. But keep reading that paragraph. They're also masters of checkers and chess, dominoes, charades, ping pong. So in the same, the same sort of paragraph where we're talking about... <coughs> mm, that's my cat. The same sort of paragraph where we're talking about... Um, he's going to distract. Where we're talking about the physical standards. Hey, Tom. Hey, man. The same paragraph where we're talking about the physical standards uh, that we all understand, we all, uh, I think, in some ways take for granted, right? <clears throat> sort of on the same level, we, we hold, like, of equal importance. You could, you could think about it that way. Um, being good at all these games, you know? So one argument that kind of presents itself in that paragraph is like, are we saying that the same standards we're thinking about also encourage 
um, sort of an ability to, to be good at all this, I mean, let's be real, like kind of useless crap, right? Um, that's an interesting definition of manhood in that paragraph. <clears throat> now, of course, we learn other, th other things about them, right? Uh, for instance, um, they're escape artists, which is kind of cool, honestly. They're in this prison camp because they've escaped from other prison camps. Um, but this is the part of the video, and I'm going to do this probably a few times. I'm going to ask you to look for this. This is important. Pause it for a second and look for this. There's one important element, one important thing about these Englishmen. It's before the paragraph we just looked at, okay? That's the only hint I'm going to give you. That you guys overlook a lot. And I would argue it kind of enables them to be the way they are, if that makes sense. So take a second. I'm going to give you a second to pause it. Okay. <clears throat> it's on page 118. Okay, it's right after that little break. Um, I'm hoping that's in the e-copy. But the paragraph begins, These lusty, ruddy vocalists were among the first English-speaking prisoners to be taken in the Second World War. Now, why is that interesting? We know they're prisoners. Why does it matter when they were made prisoner? Well, if they're among the first to be taken prisoner, how much experience do they have in the field? saying like uh, your question after this oh it's a few questions down this might get kind of out of order <clears throat> is you know why are they so different from the americans in what way are they so different from the americans they're masters of games and they're you know i guess in really good shape the americans by comparison are unhealthy unhappy sick you know maybe they sound kind of like me Right now, um, at one point, the British ask him to like vote on a um, on a leader, right? Which is a super American thing to do. It's interesting that the Brits are telling them to do that. Like, we kind of had a war about that. Us and the Brits at some point, you know, if you know your history. How do the Americans respond to that? <laughs> they basically uh, throw up a middle finger, right? I think I think Lazaro. Somebody tells him to actually fuck off, which is but that also tells you about the kind of mindset the American soldiers are in versus the English soldiers, right? <clears throat> and one thing I would kind of point out to you is in much the same way we talked in Unit 1, people aren't always just the kind of people they are. They're the kind of people they are in certain circumstances, certain forces or certain just phenomena push them in different ways. The Americans are coming from the front, right? These guys who have been in battle... Uh, some of them maybe in several battles, you know, they've seen some shit. <clears throat> they just got off those trains too, and that sound that sounded horrible, right? They've they've been through experiences, and the book wants you to think about that in a certain way, what those experiences do. But these Englishmen, for as cool as they sound, they've been in prison this whole time. And normally, again, we would think of that as a bad thing, but when you read about the kind of prison they've been in and kind of the allowances they've had. They've also, um, like they have a bunch of food through like a Red Cross error and all this stuff. Like they're kind of, they're food rich, right? In the, in the economy of a prisoner of war camp, I would imagine food is, is a great currency, right? So another way to think about this is they're almost like the 1%, you know? When you're in the 1%, you get certain privileges, you have certain powers, you're kind of allowed, you can think of it, to be the way that these Englishmen are. Um, <clears throat> man, I'm going to start whispering. But you're allowed to be the way these Englishmen are when you compare it to the Americans, and the Americans are more, again, those frontline guys, but they're, they're, they're food poor, right? They are, uh, at least when they come into the prison camp, lesser means, right? And that being of lesser means, you could argue in the book, means that you're less able to sort of meet these standards that we're talking about, right? That's an interesting commentary, not just on uh, sort of economic theory is kind of what I'm getting into, but more to the point, masculinity and the way we've talked about it thus far, we haven't considered it in this way. It's almost like you can only be, in, in this book, in this section, you can only be the man you can afford to be, right? And the Americans don't have much to buy with. Now, of course, the Englishmen, it sounds like we're kind of knocking them, and we kind of are. You can't really blame the Englishmen. 
<clears throat> but in some ways, it's almost like they're speaking a different language, right? Like they just can't understand each other. Now, on top of that, we're not going to have time to talk about this in the video, but there's some really weird stuff going on with them. Like they put on a play anytime in a text. Uh, you have someone putting on a play or putting on a show, performing, right? Like literally performing. It's almost always the case that the author wants you thinking about, well, what other things are they performing? How are they performing in other ways? Do you know what I'm saying? And I think you can very, uh, very easily make the case that they're, they're acting in one way or another comes to uh, the kinds of guys they are. Along with that, one of the other questions you have is, why do the Germans, it says the Germans adore the Englishmen, right? They love the Englishmen. Why? <coughs> <coughs>
in the zoo with Montana. Again, greatest name in literature, Montana Wild Hack. Uh, the paragraph we're going to start with uh, for the e copy people this was only the beginning of Billy's miseries. Um, that's what we're looking at. Now, read through that for a second. I'll go give you a second. Pause it if you have to. <clears throat> that is a very weird description of Billy's perspective when it comes to time, right? What the hell is that about? Well, <clears throat> to begin with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk for, well, <clears throat> to begin with, yeah, I can do it for a second. Awesome. To begin with, this description of Billy's perspective sounds a lot like <clears throat> what we talked about in our last class with comparing people to machines, right? Specifically that train car scene, Billy's on a track. So to the Trophimadorians, if your life is on one track and you can't choose where you go, you can't deviate, you're on that track, no free will. And we know that about the Trophimadorians, right? But the interesting thing, <clears throat> when they're talking about Billy's perspective, he's looking through that hole, the, the hole is tied down to and he can't look around, he can't even know he's on a track, right? The point they're making to their Tralfamadorian buddies is not only does he not have free will, because we're Tralfamadorians, we all know we don't have free will, but the sad thing for them is he doesn't know it. Because his perspective, because he can only see time uh, according to that arrow that we talked about, right? You can only look in the direction you're heading for us. That's how we experience time. You can't look around, you can't see the track, you can't realize that it's all kind of programmed, that it's all <clears throat> destiny, fate, free will, any of that business, right? I mean, destiny or fate, sorry. So you don't realize you don't have free will, you don't have any agency whatsoever. And that's very sad to them that he kind of lives this lie, right? That he thinks he has control when he doesn't. <clears throat> Now, a quick sidebar. What becomes of the universe? According to the Tralfamadorians, what happens, right? The worksheet tells you it's on page 149. I have to go back to whispering. It's on 149, right? <clears throat> they blow it up. They build the whole damn thing up. Uh, they're testing like rockets or something. And um, something goes wrong and it, it blows up the entire universe. And Billy... Stupid Billy, right, with his perspective, asks, well, if you know this, then why don't you stop it? And again, that kind of illustrates the difference we're talking about. Billy can't see the track. Billy can't look around and recognize the fact that we're always going to get to that point where that Trav Medorian pushes that button, blows up the universe. <clears throat>
person is called Billy in the narrator. And really, it's just one bit from the book. Now, a quick note, uh, 156, I call it the epitaph. I don't know if this is in e-copies that some of you have. Um, I would put money on it, though, that you could probably look this up. Vonnegut was a kooky guy, and he liked to draw doodles in his books. It's very silly. He made a lot of money doing it, so good for him. But on page 156, uh, in the big copy, we get um, Billy and Valencia's honeymoon night, uh, and it's unsettling. And we might talk about that. But what I'm talking about here, the epitaph, is this. It's a fun little picture. An epitaph, those are the words that you'll see on a gravestone. Okay? If you didn't know that word before, now you do. <clears throat> but basically, now at the end of my tea, I'm in trouble. <clears throat> basically, Billy um, is in bed with Valencia, and they've just engaged in their honeymoon activities, okay? And I'm going to read a little bit of it to you, because it's terribly interesting. So, first of all, just to draw your attention to a couple choice moments... Pages previous to this, Billy makes a noise like a small rusty hinge uh, and empties his seminal vesicles into Valencia. Now, I know that's cringeworthy. I don't enjoy reading it, to be honest with you. But that's really fucking weird language, outside of the fact that it's a, a very intimate scene. What is that medical language, right? Seminal vesicles. What about small rusty hinge? What does Billy sound like here? He sounds like a machine, doesn't he? Kind of interesting. Um, and that stuff kind of keeps going. But beyond that, <clears throat> Valencia wants to talk to Billy um, about the war. And the narrator, who's not very kind to Valencia most of the time, he's not kind to her here. She says, I'm proud you were a soldier. Do you know that? And he says, good which is a hell of a response from Billy. She says, was it awful? And he says, sometimes. But just be, uh, before this, to set the scene up, <coughs> um, it sets the scene. Valencia is, is going to ask him about the war. Those are the moments I just pointed out to you. The narrator says, it was a simple-minded thing for a female earthling to do to associate sex and clamor with war. So it's kind of implying that maybe that's not the right thing to do. Not least of which, again, because it sounds like we're kind of thinking about Mary here and the stuff that she's worried about. But the narrator points out that that's just what Valencia is about to do. They've just had sex. So her mind, according to the narrator, immediately goes to other associations, movies she's seen. She's never been in war, so what does she know about it? Well, she knows movies. That's what the narrator is telling us. So in some ways, this is another symptom of the problem Mary raises in the first chapter. <clears throat> but back to what I was talking about. Billy says sometimes, sometimes it was awful in the war. And then we get this. A crazy thought now occurred to Billy. The truth of it startled him. It would make a good epitaph for Billy Pilgrim and for me too. Me being the narrator. And we get the epitaph on the next page. This is a famous, famous, famous line. People have this tattooed on their bodies, okay? This is a, this is a thing, okay? Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Thoughts about that? Number one, <clears throat> and I mean it, if you have not answered these questions on the worksheet, I want you to pause for each one to begin with. Why is this a perfect epitaph for Billy? Right? Thinking about Billy and what we know about him, his ideas, uh, not just about war, but about his life, about time, and about agency. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Why would that be a perfect epitaph for Billy? Well, before you pause it, <clears throat> what is an epitaph? It goes on your tombstone, right? Why? Well, it's not really for you, right? It's for people you leave behind. And then beyond them, it's for anyone else who may see your grave.
gravestone in some ways it's like the smallest biography written right <clears throat> it's a few words at most like a sentence or whatever that's meant to somehow sum you up sum up what you stood for all right so so how does this epitaph stand for billy go ahead and pause it write something down
slides on the dirt, right? It's sarcastic. It's a joke. It's kind of funny, right? In a dark way. On a gravestone, everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Is funny. So that kind of tells us if it's a joke, if we read it that way from the narrator, which I do, because he's so opposed to Billy's view, that he's trying to get us to think about the things that aren't beautiful, that do hurt. He wants us to be like him and like Lot's wife. He wants us to look at those things and it might turn us to salt. But just like we talked about last time, <clears throat> it's important to recognize those things for different reasons. And if you go all the way back to the Tralfamatorian model, no free will, only look at the beautiful things, ignore the ugliness. If you, if you think about Billy's perspective, that there's no free will, and then you go along with the narrator and say, actually, we should look at those things, you're also supposing there is free will, that we do have some power, even if it's small, and that we can do something, even if we feel like it's very little, even if we feel like we lose every time. So the tombstone, if it's sarcastic, is a rallying cry to try to do something, right? To live in the face of all those larger forces that do have control over you. Um, in kind of the ways we talked about Little Boy, right? In Unit 1, they don't have much control in that poem. They may not have any control. The narrator, though, would say that you sound like Billy there. You sound defeated. try. You can fight glaciers, you can fight wars against them, against having them if you're the narrator. I mean, even if they still come um, to, to sort of admit defeat there puts you in Billy's shoes. And to me the narrator is, is, is sort of saying that for most of us we are Billy. And if you're sickened at all by Billy if you think that his, his opinions or his perspective is, like, toxic or unhelpful or annoying. Billy is fucking annoying to me. He's very annoying. Well, the narrator kind of feels like maybe most of us are that way most of the time. And that's kind of what the tombstone wants you to think about. That's all I have for Vonnegut today. I'm hoping I get my voice back. This is awful. If you stuck around for this long in the video, I really appreciate it. Please uh, get your answers turned in <clears throat> in a separate document on Course 10. That'll be a little homework grade. Um, let me know if you have questions as we go. We're just going to keep figuring it out. All right, I appreciate it.